Jenny Hill Pulsifer is an Associate Professor of History at Brigham Young University, specializing in early American and American Indian history. She received her PhD in American history from Brandeis University in 1999 and began teaching at BYU in the fall of 1998. Her first book, Subjects Unto the Same King, Indians English in the Contest for Authority in Colonial New England was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2005 and was selected as a Choice Magazine Outstanding Academic Title in 2006. Her second book, Swindler Sachem, The American Indian Who Sold His Birthright, Dropped Out of Harvard, and Conned the King of England, focuses on Indian English struggles over native land and sovereignty during an era of political turmoil in the English Empire and reveals how one remarkable man Man, John Wampas navigated these perilous waters for the benefit of himself and his people. Additionally, she has published articles in the William and Mary Quarterly, Early American Literature, the New England Quarterly, and the Massachusetts Historical Review. Dr. Pulsifer's upcoming book, Shadow Sacagawea, A Family History of Race and Religion in the American West, will examine the life and experiences of her fourth great-grandmother, Sally Xavier Ward, a Shoshone Indian woman who married first a French Canadian and then an American fur trader, bore four race children, and was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, thus beginning a family history in which Anglo-European, Native, and Mormon cultures with their respective approaches to race and religion combined, clashed, and shaped the choices and identities of her descendants. This is the story that she will be sharing with us today. Let's welcome Dr. Pulsifer. Thank you for coming. It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, Sagajawea may be the most famous American Indian woman, although Pocahontas gives her a run for her money boosted no, bout, uh, no doubt by recent political allusions. A Shoshone from what is now called Idaho, Sagajawea was taken captive by Hidatsa Indians and sold to a French trapper. She bore him two children, and with him served as interpreter and guide to the Lewis and Clark expedition sent to investigate the vast swath of land President Jefferson purchased from France in 1803. Her image, not Pocahontas's, appeared on the U.S. gold dollar coin issued in 2000. I'm going to, oops, which way do I aim it? At here? Let's see. I'll keep reading. Um, and she has been the subject of countless articles, books, films, animations, and other pop culture productions from the 19th century to the present. She's the iconic Native woman, a stand-in for all other Native women whenever the symbol of a female American Indian is needed. And therein lies the problem. One of the challenges for women's history has been to accord women more than symbolic status, to recognize their individual contributions, personalities, strengths, and weaknesses. The Shadow Sacagawea of my title is my great-great-great-great-grandmother, a Shoshone woman known to my family. Thank you. Oh, whoops. There we go. So there's some examples of the pop culture references to Sacagawea. Um, She's known to my family by the English name of Sally and by the last names of her two white husbands, Exervier and Ward. Her life both parallels and has been overshadowed by Sagajuias, as have the lives of countless other Native women in the 19th century American West. Both the documented and oral history portions of Sagajuias' life are well known to many. Sally's story will be new to you, but you will hear echoes of Sagajuias' story in it. An exploration of Sally Xervier Ward's life not only serves as an act of individual recovery, but illuminates a number of topics of great importance to our understanding of the American West. These include the impact of European settlement, including settlement by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on native peoples, the Indian slave trade, the influence of racial ideology on missions to and relations with the Indians, and the causes of violence between natives and settlers. These issues weave in and out of Sally's story, 
but I will approach that story here in a traditional chronological narrative. So we'll start at the beginning, Sally's birth. We don't know when or where Sally was born, just as we don't know when or where famous women like Sagajuia and Pocahontas were born. Family oral histories are somewhat contradictory. My father's mother told it this way. Two trappers around the 1840s, returning with their pelts, crossed an Indian battlefield. There had been a battle between the Crow and Shoshone Indians, and everyone on the battlefield was dead, except a baby girl crying by her dead mother. One trapper said, let's shoot her and put her out of her misery. The other said, we can keep her alive with jerky broth. Other family histories give the same baby on a battlefield account with different details. I have 10 different versions that seem to be drawn from the same original account by Naomi Brown Brown, a great granddaughter of Sally, written or recorded in 1937 by a WPA worker and then republished in local newspapers and pioneer story collections in Utah. In all but one of these, the battle is not between two Indian tribes, but between the Shoshones and United States soldiers at Battle Creek, Wyoming. Oddly, none of these accounts draw from the earliest oral history account of Sally, the obituary of her daughter, Adelaide Exervia Brown, published in 1896, with the information likely provided by her husband of 40 years, James Moorhead Brown. Here's what that account says about Sally's earliest years. Adelaide Brown was born at Fort Laramie, Wyoming, October 23, 1838. She was the daughter of Baptiste Xervier, a Frenchman and a mountaineer. Her mother's name was Sally, the daughter of Kamutsi, a chief of the Shoshone Indians. The home of Adelaide's grandparents was in the region of the headwaters of Green River in Wyoming. The issue of their marriage was one son and one daughter, Sally the eldest and her brother Ishamana. Sally was born about 1808. In her early childhood, while her parents and a small band of Indians hunting in the Black, were hunting in the Black Hills, Sally was shot and wounded in the back by a Sioux who were hostile to the other Indians. The wound, however, was not mortal. Soon after this sad event in the family of Kamutsi, Sally, who was then about six or seven years of age, was placed under the care of an aunt or someone intimate with the family. She remained under the care of this friend until she was about 12 years old. After that time, she was taken to St. Louis, Missouri, by a wealthy merchant. Given the likely source of this information and the early date, I place more trust in it than in the other accounts. So where did the baby on the battlefield come from? That image is a trope of Western history, appearing in multiple accounts, documents, and, and other accounts. A young Indian child being wounded by a Sioux Indian is close enough to the trope to blend into it over the years. And once the invented version received the imprimatur of print, as in the case of Naomi Brown Brown's 1937 version, it gets perpetuated indefinitely. All family accounts agree that at some point in her childhood, Sally lived in St. Louis. Adelaide's obituary says she was taken there around the age of 12 by a wealthy merchant. Other accounts say she was taken there by U.S. soldiers. While family accounts don't mention why Sally was in St. Louis, the historical record explored in many recent books makes it almost certain that Sally was a slave. Indian slavery was a thriving business from the very beginning of European settlement in the Americas. Indian captives taken in war, then exchanged or sold into slavery in Native American and European communities, were a linchpin of that trade. And there were hundreds of them <clears throat> in the fur trade center of St. Louis over the course of the 18th and early 19th centuries. Sally, wounded and separated from her immediate family as an adolescent, seems to have been taken captive or sold into slavery, ending up in domestic service in St. Louis. Family history recounts Sally's unhappiness serving under an unkind mistress, and at about the age of 16, she decided to run away and rejoin her, her Shoshone people. Here the story acquires a heroic slant, even in the comparatively staid obituary account, which states, the first step she took to accomplish her purpose was to swim the Mississippi River to an island. This feat she accomplished in safety. 
She remained on the island two days and then commenced her solitary journey to her native land and her friends. She traveled up the Mississippi River for several days and then stopped to rest at the house of a trapper. There, for the first time, she met Baptiste Exervier, with whom she soon became acquainted. Now, interestingly, historian Leah Vanderveld points out that there was, in fact, an island in the Mississippi River by St. Louis that by the 1820s had become a known refuge for runaway slaves, Duncan Island. It was located in a portion of the river without strong currents. It had trees for shelter, and it was quite possible to swim to it. If Sally did indeed swim the Mississippi, the island of family memory would likely have been that one. Other than the oral histories mentioned, including the obituary, I have no information on Sally's courtship and marriage to Baptiste Exervier. Adelaide's obituary refers to him as a mountaineer, a name commonly used for men engaged in the fur trade in the Rockies. The fur trade was notable for widespread intermarriage between Europeans and Indians, although the arrangement known as the custom of the country often lacked the imprimatur of church or civil authority. The marriage of Exervier and Sally was probably of this variety. White traders married into Indian culture, into Indian families for strategic reasons, to learn native languages or gain a live-in interpreter, to secure favorable trade relations with a tribe, or to have the comfort of a hardworking wife. Indian women's reasons for engaging in marriage with Europeans were equally strategic. Once a trader married an Indian woman, her family was guaranteed access to his trade goods. The marriage smoothed relations between Indians and the home community of the trapper, and Indian women may have believed that their bicultural children would enjoy special advantages. Thus, intermarriage was a form of cultural reciprocity that built strong cross-cultural relationships. While we don't have a documentary record of a marriage between Exervier and Sally, we do have one solid artifact of their union, a daughter. All family records agree that Adelaide Exervier was born at Fort Laramie, October 23rd, 1838. I'll just, this is just a picture of some Shoshone women. And uh, there's a series of paintings by an artist named Alfred, Stanley, uh, Alfred Jacob Miller. Um, that highlights this time period. He was actually present at that time. Um, so he drew a lot of paintings of trappers and native people, including the many native women who were married to trappers. And he also painted Fort Laramie at this very time. So these two paintings are images of Fort Laramie in the, on the outside and on the interior. The approximate year of Adelaide's birth first appears in an 1860 Utah Territorial Census, and the year, date, and place of the birth reappear on numerous succeeding documents. That there were French trappers with Indian wives and French Indian children at Fort Laramie in 1838 and 1839 is documented in the journals of Mrs. Eels of the Whitman Re Expedition and German physician Dr. Frederick Adolphus Wislazenus. Sally apparently also had a son at Fort Laramie, Ishimana or John. According to the obituary, John died around the age of three. The next documented mention of Sally, although she has not yet been called that name or any other name in any record, is in 1843. On July 4th of that year, Lancaster P. Lupton's fort in Colorado saw a great deal of action. Town legend claims a duel was fought that day between two men both in love with the same Mexican girl. Contemporary accounts are silent about that. At least three contemporary accounts do note another piece of violence that day, however, the mortal wounding of Baptiste Exuvier. Theodore Talbot, a member of John C. Fremont's second expedition, which happened to be passing through, wrote that Lancaster Lupton, quote, brought news of the death of Exervier, one of his men, who had been shot in a frolic, or rather a brawl, on the 4th of July by Thomas Fallon, a hand belonging to St. Vrain's Fort. Rufus Sage, an employee of Lupton, also described the death of the, quote, old mountaineer who lingered agonizingly until July 11th. The earliest family story, the obituary, corroborates the journals, stating, when Adelaide was about four years old, 
Her father was shot in the back and mortally wounded by a mountaineer. He survived 10 days and then died. In the later family history accounts, being shot in a drunken brawl is replaced by a less scandalous demise, the dreaded scourge of pioneer days, spotted fever. Albert Brown Clark, a descendant of Sally and avid researcher, discovered Fremont's account of Xervier's murder as a young man and declared to his mother, I found grandpa. He reported, she was not well pleased. The Brown family's quest for respectability is likely one explanation of the mid-20th century alteration in the cause of death. Sally, still unnamed, a fate even Sagajuia shared in most contemporary accounts, does appear in the description of her husband's death. Fremont himself waxed poetical about her, declaring, the wife of the murdered man, an Indian woman of the Snake Nation, desirous like Naomi of old to return to her people, requested and obtained permission to travel with my party to the neighborhood of Bear River, where she expected to meet with some of their villages. She traveled with the party for nearly a month, from July 20th through August 18th, and was mentioned in the journals of Fremont as well as two of his men, Charles Pruce and Theodore Talbot. Near the turnoff for Fort Bridger in the Green River country, which had long been a Shoshone homeland, Sally left the party and again vanished from the documentary record. In a striking example of Sagajuia's overshadowing of the unknown Sally's story, Wyoming historian Grace Hebbard cites Fremont's account of this Shoshone woman and claims that she was, in fact, Sagajuia, returning to the Shoshones after a long stay with the Comanches. Hebbard glossed over the problem of this woman being the widow of Xervier. She was Shoshone. Her husband was French. She had two children. She fit. Within a few years of Xervier's death, Sally married Elijah Barney Ward, a mountaineer from Virginia. Family accounts of the marriage match the biographical sketch of Ward found in the widely distributed LDS Biographical Encyclopedia by church historian Andrew Jensen. Jensen wrote Ward's life based on an interview with Polly Ward Williams, Sally's daughter by Barney Ward. Other than Adelaide's obituary, Polly's is the earliest family account, and the many similarities of later accounts to its wording make it virtually certain that they drew from it. According to the encyclope encyclopedia account, Exervede's, quote, very dear friend, Barney Ward, promised him on his deathbed to take care of his wife and children. Contemporary accounts of Xervier's death do not mention Ward, and there's no evidence he was at Fort Lupton in July 1843. Adelaide's obituary of 1896 says nothing about a relationship between Sally's two mountaineer husbands, and Fremont's account has Sally leaving the expedition near Green River, accompanied only by her children. It seems most likely that she met Ward, who traded with Native people throughout the Mountain West, after she had returned to live with the Shoshones. When the Mormon pioneers arrived in the Salt Lake Valley on July 24, 1847, Sally Xervier Ward and her daughter Adelaide, her second husband Elijah Barney Ward, and their newborn daughter Polly were already living in the area. Polly Ward was born at Fort Bridger July 15, 1847. Barney Ward soon began working as an interpreter for Brigham Young, moving his family into the old fort in Salt Lake by the spring of 1848. Louisa Jane, Sally and Barney's second daughter, would be born there on May 26, 1848. Having an American Indian family, a Shoshone mother, American father, and three mixed-race children living in the old fort must have raised considerable interest among the exiled saints. Americans in general were intrigued and unnerved by Indians, but Mormons had additional doctrinal reasons for their interest. Their sacred scripture, the Book of Mormon, was an account of Lehi and his family, Jewish immigrants to the New World, whose descendants were among the American Indians. These descendants, called Lamanites, were children of Israel whom God had promised to restore to a knowledge of the Christian gospel in the latter days. Sally's daughter, Adelaide Exervia, participated in one of the first efforts to meet this obligation. At the age of 10, she attended Zina D. H. Young's school in the old fort in Salt Lake City, probably beginning in the latter months of 1848. Zina recorded in her journal in January 1849, quote, a Lamanite girl by the name of Adelaide is coming to school, thus fulfilling old Father Smith's words on my head when but 14 years old. 
Zina Young's blessing from Father Smith and her claim that it was fulfilled by teaching Adelaide highlight early Latter-day Saints' special relationship with American Indians. Like the Puritans 300 years before, Mormons believed that their role was to restore the Indians to a knowledge of the truth they once had. While Mormons and Puritans believed that Native people were their spiritual equals, they also believed themselves to be culturally superior to the Indians, and therefore able to raise them to a higher level of civilization through precept and example. This paternalistic approach would create resentment and conflict between the two peoples. Nevertheless, Zina and Adelaide developed what seems to have been a mutually affectionate relationship. Adelaide would later name one of her daughters, Martha Zina, in her teacher's honor, and cherished a signed photograph of her. In 1853, Brigham Young called a group of missionaries to preach to the Shoshone people of southwestern Wyoming. Barney Ward, who by then had been baptized into the church, was one of those sent on the new mission to Fort Supply, and he took along his wife, Sally, and their two younger daughters. Later, Adelaide, who had been continuing her schooling in Salt Lake City, joined them, and she and Sally served as language instructors to the LDS missionaries. Ward's fellow missionary, Henry W. Sanderson, noted that he, quote, took lessons in the Shoshonean languages language from a young half-breed woman that has been raised among the Indians, a stepdaughter of Barney Ward. Fort Supply was located near the Green River, a traditional gathering place of the Shoshone Indians, and the presence of Sally Ward at the mission helped make it a magnet for other Shoshones of the area. It's possible that Sally's marriage to Barney Ward prompted Apostle Orson Hyde's suggestion that the other missionaries intermarry with local Shoshone women, something that they thought would pave the way to widespread conversion. Following this council, James S. Brown visited Shoshone Chief Washakie and indicated the missionaries' interest in taking Indian wives. Washakie replied, White men might look around, and if any one of us found a girl that would go with him, it would be all right. But the Indians must have the same privilege among white men. Washakie's response was a clear indication of the American Indian expectations of reciprocity in their interactions with white settlers. Reciprocity, an assumption that relationships entailed mutual obligations, was a foundational principle in many American Indian societies, both within their own tribes and between themselves and other Native people. As Europeans settled North America, Indians tried to re establish reciprocal relations with them too. One form of reciprocal relationship was alliance, which usually accompanied trade. But native trade and alliance almost always entwined with kinship. Trade gatherings were opportunities for alliance building intermarriages, and alliances always included expressions of kinship, fictive and actual. Thus, ties between two distinct peoples occur occurred on multiple levels, and reciprocity was expected in all of these exchanges. Like many other 19th century Americans, most Mormons were not open to intermarriage with Indians, and that lack of full reciprocity introduced distrust into Mormon-Indian relations. An example of this occurred after the Walker War of 1853. Soon after Mormons settled Manti in San Pete Valley, the Ute chief Wakara visited Brigham Young to ask for permission to marry a Mormon woman. Wakara had by this time been baptized a member of the church and received the priesthood, so there was no religious barrier to intermarriage. Young said, certainly, if Wakara could find one who would have him. Wakara returned to San Pete and asked Mary Artemisia Lowry, the 21-year-old daughter of Manti's bishop, to marry him, a choice likely connected to her status as the daughter of the local Mormon chief. Her status would enhance Wakara's and strengthen the ties between Utes and Mormons. A contemporary account of Wakara's proposal fairly drips with contempt that Mormons felt for their Indian neighbors. Quote, he poured into her ears the tale of a splendidly elegant and imposing wickiup he would build for her, told her how rich he was, what numberless droves of horses he owned, and how he would furnish her future home in such barbaric splendor as should astonish all beholders. Mary was horrified. She feared snubbing the chief might endanger her family and even her town, so she cast about for the only solution she could think of. 
she claimed she was already polygamously married to her sister's husband. As the story goes, Wakara plunged his knife into the kitchen table, stalked out, and later complained loudly of the insult. The San Pete Saints had rejected Wakara's request for reciprocal kin relations and made it clear that they did not consider the Indian chief a suitable partner for the Mormon bishop's daughter. They had demonstrated that Mormons shared 19th century Anglo-Americans' cultural distaste for what they increasingly viewed as, quote, inferior savages, despite the religious imperatives that pushed them to believe and behave otherwise. Even among LDS missionaries to the Indians who had been specifically direct directed to take native wives, there were very few white Indian marriages, and most of those that did occur did not last long. Historian Richard Kitchen suggests that the reluctance of the missionaries to intermarry with Indians was a significant factor in the failure of the first phase of the Fort Supply mission that Sally and Barney Ward participated in. Repugnance for intermarriage seems to have extended to the Indians being raised inside Mormon families, very few of whom married white Mormons. Around 400 Indians lived in Mormon households in the 19th century, mostly in the first decade of Mormon settlement. They were there as a result of the Mormon encounter with the New Mexican trade in guns, horses, and Indian slaves. The slave trade was practiced in Utah long before the Mormons arrived. By the early 19th century, it had become a violent and destructive system in which the women and children of non-equestrian tribes like the Paiutes were taken captive by Ute Indians who exchanged them for guns and horses. When the Mormons arrived in 1847, they found this system firmly in place. Looking for closer sources of trade, the Utes immediately offered Indian slaves to the Mormon newcomers, who were appalled and refused to buy them. The consequences of their refusal were immediate and game-changing. In one incident, the Ute chief, Arapine, offered to sell a child to a Mormon. When he refused, Arapine dashed the child's brains out against a rock, threw the body at the Mormon's feet, and declared, You have no heart, or you would have bought him and saved his life. Given the horrifying alternative, Mormons began purchasing Indian captives and placing them in their own households. Eventually, the territorial legislature let, uh, legalized the practice as an indenture system, including the stipulation that children from 7 to 16 years of age attend school at least three months a year. Indians in the indenture system were released upon reaching adulthood or after repaying their purchase price. Mormons viewed this system in two ways. At the basic economic level, the Indian children in Mormon homes provided needed household or agricultural labor. At the religious level, the system allowed Mormons to teach Indians their religion and, quote, civilize them, thus fulfilling their religious obligations. Indians experienced a range of conditions within the LDS indenture system, but full acceptance within the larger community was exceedingly rare. Like the Indian indenture system in place in Catholic New Mexico, the LDS system rested on the need for labor as well as a desire to teach Indians Christianity. In some Mormon households, as in Catholic households, Indians were overworked, beaten, or abused. In others, they were treated as members of the family, even being provided with legacies in wills. But almost none of them were accepted as marriage partners within Mormon society. Richard Kitchen's study of Mormon-Indian relations in the Intermountain West found only seven couples um, examples of Indians marrying uh, white Mormon partners before 1870, and most of these marriages occurred in the context of missions to the Indians. Racial and cultural prejudice prevented widespread intermarriage, leaving fostered Indians in a, cultured, or a cultural no-man's land. One Native woman living with the Mormons responded to the limbo by choosing to have children outside of wedlock. She declared, I have a right to children. No white man will marry me. I cannot live with the Indians, but I can have children, and I will support the children I have. God meant that a woman have children. The woman's declaration that she could not live with the Indians is a poignant comment on being caught between two cultures. A Native woman raised in white society would likely imbibe all the prejudices of that society, making it difficult for her to imagine returning to her own people, even though no white man would marry her. 
Such examples from the lives of American Indian women highlight the failure of 19th century Mormons to bring their cultural and religious beliefs into harmony. Their religion may have taught them that Indi uh, their religion may have taught them that Indians were heirs of Israel, God's chosen people, but their culture taught them that Indians were uncivilized and inferior, not fit to marry their daughters. With few exceptions, Mormons and Indians did not intermarry. One of those exceptions was the 1855 marriage of Adelaide Exervia, Sally's daughter, to Mormon missionary James Brown at Fort Supply. They would later move to Ogden, Utah, and raise a family of 11 children, one of whom became the bishop of the Ogden First Ward. Adelaide's story, and that of her children and grandchildren, is just as interesting as Sally's, offering an intimate view of a mixed-race family in a starkly divided Mormon-Gentile town in northern Utah, but it's a story for another time. Sally's experience at Fort Supply provides another instance of Sagajuia's legend overshadowing her story. Grace Hebbard built much of the framework of her biography of Sagajuia on the close relationship Sagajuia, also called Porovo, had with Basil, who Hebbard identified as her adopted son, Toussaint. Her claim that Sagajuia had close ties with the Mormon church that she helped establish agricultural practice among the Shoshone, and that she was a valued interpreter was largely based on information that Hebbard received from the historian's office of the LDS Church, which she does not seem to have visited in person. These records were summaries from the church's journal history, a chronological scrapbook with condensed accounts of events. The more detailed accounts reveal that many of the events Hebbard claimed for Sagajuia actually involved Sally, Adelaide, and several other Shoshone women living at Fort Supply, where Basil was a frequent visitor as well. It is likely that Hebbard's assumption that Sagajuia was responsible for actions carried out by other Indian women reflected her promotion of women's rights. Like her contemporary and friend Eva Emery Dye, whose novel The Conquest spawned mo monuments to Sagajuia nationwide, Hebbard saw Sagajuia as a perfect American feminist icon, capable, strong, and native born. Hebbard's conflation of Sally's and Sagajuia's stories also may have arisen from a too narrow focus on Sagajuia's life at the expense of the broader historical context of the 19th century American West. Sally's life after this brief but well-documented period becomes more difficult to trace. Family legend says that she left Barney Ward during a period of political tension and returned to her Shoshone people, either just before Johnston's army invaded Utah in 1857 or just before Utah's Black Hawk War of 1865 through 1872. The U.S. Census shows Ward living alone in North Bend, later Fairview, Utah in 1860, Ward became one of the first white casualties of the Black Hawk War in 1865 when he and another man were killed in Salina Canyon. Sally's orphaned daughters provide another illustration of Mormons' disappointing native expectations of reciprocity. As a trader and interpreter, Ward was well known to the Ute Indians, and his murder and mutilation seemed to have been payback for previous incidents including Ward's participation in the 1850 Fort Utah fight between Mormon settlers and Ute Indians. Following the murders, the Ute chief Sandpitch claimed that Ward had promised him his two young daughters, Polly and Louisa, as wives and demanded that they be delivered to him. Because Ward was dead when Sandpitch made his claim, it is impossible to know whether he had really promised the girls to Sandpitch. Ward had a history of telling people what they wanted to hear, so it's certainly possible. Local settlers claimed that Sandpitch had mistreated his other wives, so they refused to comply with his demand, alerted church leaders to the crisis, and hustled Louisa Ward off to Salt Lake City under heavy guard. Polly Ward was away from home at the time, visiting her sister Adelaide in Ogden. It is probable that Sandpitch's demand was, like Wakara's earlier request, an attempt to secure the truly reciprocal kin relations that intermarriage represented. The public repudiation of a Ute chief's demand was undoubtedly humiliating to Sandpitch and certainly could have contributed to the outbreak of the Black Hawk War, as some contemporaries claimed. 
As the incident involving Sandpitch and Ward's daughters um, indicates, failures of reciprocity could lead to conflict. Mormons not only refused to intermarry with Indians to any significant extent, but they also refused to engage in the slave trade that had previously enriched the Ute Indians. This action cut Utes off from the stream of horses, guns, and goods of the New Mexican trade, creating tension between the Mormons and local Indians. Mormon settlement itself also created tremendous and rapidly increasing tensions, cutting off Indians from normal food sources. Had Mormons and Indians become one people, as the natives seemed to desire, their kin networks could have balanced some of the losses brought on by Mormon settlement. Kin shared their resources sources with each other. In the absence of that reciprocal relationship, Indians responded to their losses with violence. They raided livestock and engaged in a series of destructive and costly wars with local residents. And what became of Sally? Family legend has it that for years, she and her son or brother John and his wife, Madam, came to Ogden at harvest time and camped behind the Brown household. One year, quote, the lonely Indian woman, Sally, left with her son, but she never returned. The year of her death is unknown. Her great-granddaughter, Ella Brown, thought it was in the late 1850s at Fort Bridger, Other accounts don't even attempt to guess where she went or when she died. Visits of other Shoshone Indians to the Brown family, some of whom James M. Brown likely met during a second mission to the Shoshone in Idaho, continued well into the 20th century. Adelaide's granddaughter, Vida, lived among the Shoshone at Washakie, Utah for a time. During World War II, Moroni Timbimbu, the Shoshone Mormon bishop of the town of Washakie, Utah, lived with his family in a cabin behind Adelaide's daughter-in-law, Dolly Brown's home in Clearfield. Dolly's grandson, Albert Brown Clark, asked Moroni's daughter, May Timbimbu Perry, just when the Browns and the Timbimbus got acquainted. She replied that they seemed to have always known each other. So what does this have to do with Sagajawea? The most obvious parallel is Fremont's account of Xervier's widow, which Grace Hebbard assumed was Sagajawea. Other parallels include the fact that both women lived in St. Louis for a time, married French-speaking trappers, and had at least two children by them. Most historians believe Sagajawea's story ends there. In Hebbard's view, a view shared by many Wind River Shoshone people, the story did not end. Someone lived at Wind River who spoke French and English who had traveled across the country with white men, who had close ties to Shoshone subchief Basil, who was respected by Mormons as well as Shoshones. All of these characteristics fit Sally as well as the woman Hebbard believed to be Sagajawea. They likely fit other women as well. Censuses taken among the Wind River Shoshone in 1898 and 1899, when there were around 800 tribe members, include at least seven families with French surnames, such as La Jeunesse, St. Clair, and Leclerc. Shoshone women made up the largest single percentage of Native women intermarrying with trappers. Undoubtedly, there were a number of women at Wind River in the late 19th and early 20th century who could both speak French and remember travel with white men. One of these may have been Sally. Consider the following account of, quote, Sally Ann, by Edmo Leclerc, a Wind River Shoshone and son of a French mountaineer. I believed that Basil's mother had lived and traveled with an old Indian woman by the name of Sally Ann. This woman tells some of the experiences of Porivo, Basil's mother. I heard some of these stories of hers only in parts. I heard her tell my mother a story about a big fish that spouted water high up towards the sky. Another story was that she had traveled with some white people somewhere, and they were starving. And still in another story, she described that she went down the big water with her husband, lived among the French people at a place called Portage. Sally Ann used to tell the travels of Porivo as if it were her own. Is this Sally Ann my grandmother, Sally? It's hard to say. Her experiences told in more detail in the rest of LeClaire's account are similar to Sally's and to Sagajawea's. LeClaire claims Sally Ann died a few years after 1885, which is later than I have guessed Sally died, but it's only a guess. 
Perhaps Sally Ann is yet another Shoshone woman who married a French mountaineer, traveled with white men throughout the West, and returned to live with her people. It's clear that there are many, many gaps to fill in in this story, just as there are in the story of Sagajuia, despite the tremendous amount of attention that has been paid to it in the last 150 years. Given the scarcity of Native American historical sources and the conflicts in oral history accounts, uncovering the stories of individual Native people is very difficult. But I keep finding small slivers of documentary information that I can use to rearrange the puzzle of oral history pieces. Fitting these pieces into the larger history that continues to be written about Indians and settlers in the West is both personally rewarding and historically enlightening. I hope someday soon to have both a more complete understanding of my grandmother and a more accurate and expansive view of the native and immigrant peoples who shaped the history of the place both call home. Thank you. Dr. Jenny Pulsifer's presentation told the story of the lives of two extraordinary women, one whose story we have heard dozens of times and one whose story was unknown to most of us before today. Sacagawea's story is important. She is an example of a Native woman who was able to successfully navigate her Native roots and her later life in Anglo-European culture. From Sacagawea, we see that women in history are often not evaluated as real people, rather as symbols. Because of this, we lose sight of the individual contributions of lesser known women. Dr. Pulsifer's work is restoring the balance. As she tells her fourth great grandmother's story, Sally Exerbier Ward was an extraordinary woman who, among her many accomplishments, faced a world of prejudice with grace. Sally's story reminds uh, Sally, Sally's story reveals the failure of earlier saints to allow their belief not to overshadow, sorry, um, the failure of earlier saints to allow their belief to overshadow their cultural bias. It calls on us all to be better, and that is why it is important. We will now turn the time over to Camry for our Q&A. All right, so I'll start with a question, and then if anyone wants to come up to the microphone, um, we can probably have one or two questions. And if you need to leave, because um, I know we're running short on time, you can, but if you're okay if some people stay and ask a couple questions. So I just wanted to start with a question. You mentioned the story of the Native woman um, who was raised or living with a white family, and so she was torn between the two cultures. Um, so my question is, through your own experience within your family, you guys have a mix of cultures. Um, do you feel that one culture seemed to take precedence over the others, or do you believe that over time that it kind of became a mixture of taking pieces from different cultures and developing into your own unique family culture? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, and I forgot to dial through the last couple of slides, so I'll... I just want to show you, this is Adelaide, Adelaide Xervier Ward. Um, okay, in answer to that question, things change over time. So um, early on, it seemed like there were people in the family who, uh, who identified more with their native heritage. For instance, Vida um, Brown, who is a granddaughter of Adelaide, um, goes to live with the Shoshone at Washakie, Utah. Um, her children, um, like her, are very strongly identified with, with Native people. And in fact, her son actually gets identified as Indian on his draft application for World War II. Um, part of that probably has to do with the fact that they happen to look more Native than some of the other members of the family. Um, but in every generation, you can kind of see that repeating. There's a family that I know right now that also has a number of children who kind of have that more of a native than a European look, and they identify very strongly with kind of their native heritage. In my own family, um, we always knew these stories, and I always thought they were really cool. <laughs> and so 
I had a strong identification with that. But that's not to say that I identify myself as Native. I'm quite far removed from, from this, this story. And so it's a part of my, my family story, but I feel like I still have a lot to learn about Native culture and peoples. how like the recent political atmosphere of, of Pocahontas. So my question is, how do you feel about the issue concerning Elizabeth Warren, um, where she claims Native American heritage, but the Cherokee Nation issued a statement saying that her claiming it was um, kind of harmful? And I guess along with that is, how Native American do you have to be to be considered Native American? OK, good question. <laughs> it was very interesting to kind of watch that, that uh, exchange. Um, Elizabeth Warren um, has actually never claimed to be Native American. She hasn't applied for citizenship in the Cher Cherokee tribe. Um, but she does claim to have heritage, and that seems to be legitimate. Um, unlike my family, where the stories were passed down and, and we have you know, lots of documents that establish that connection, the stories in her family seem to be mostly legend. So she was unable to establish that through genealogy, only through kind of the DNA test. And it seems to have been kind of a political misstep because in spite of the fact that she tried to make it clear that she was not claiming uh, that she was Native American, um, uh, people on the other kind of side of the political spectrum were eager to make it seem that she had made that claim because it makes her look foolish. Um, so it's there's lots of politicking going on <laughs> on both sides. Now, it's also worth pointing out that um, the qualifications for claiming a Native American heritage are determined by tribes, by individual tribes. And they're different for every tribe. So for instance, among the Cherokee, to claim uh, heritage, you have to be able to trace your ancestry to someone who appeared on the Dawes Rolls um, at the end of the 19th century. And so it's actually very possible to be a member of the Native tribe and, and, have, uh, and be very removed uh, in terms of blood quantum, which is a way that people have once talked about this. Um, but that's just the Cherokee's requirement. Other tribes, particularly in the West, where um, where there are far more visible native communities um, have requirements of, say, a quarter or an eighth um, or you know a mother or a father. I mean, again, it depends on the tribe. They determine their own requirements. You're welcome. <laughs> 